Uh, just a quick note on my slides and my presentation. I will tweet out the link for it uh, later. There is a lot of links inside the slides. So I've intended for you to be able to use these slides as a reference material. Uh, so you can sort of dig down and figure out what you need to do. I can't prescribe to you. I don't know your life. I can't say what you need the most. Um, so hopefully, we can start putting together a bit of a, a community you know, for personal development and help support each other with what we've learned. So I'm going to be doing uh, a survey or something like that uh, on Twitter a little bit afterwards. So if you are interested, even if you just want to consume some content uh, or if you want to help uh, you know, give your insights, please feel free to interact. Uh, I'll be putting something together. Cool. So don't worry about taking too much notes. Uh, it'll all be sent out. Uh, good stuff. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's Ryan. Uh, I'm quite a foodie. Love my food, as you can probably tell. Uh, I also love to paint with airbrush, uh, mostly Warhammer stuff, but I've started doing some canvases, uh, which is very therapeutic, something that's not on the computer. So I can highly recommend some sort of creative outlet for you guys. Cool. Just a bit of a disclaimer. There will be a bunch of memes. So if you don't like memes, uh, there is probably a few minutes you can go to another talk. Uh, cool. So I'd just like to do a bit of a survey, quick impromptu survey. So if you could please put up your hand and keep it up until uh, for a few sec few minutes. Um, anybody here struggling with diet lately or in the last six months? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Maybe eating if it done. Just keep your hands up. Uh, anybody struggling to exercise properly? What about sleep? Anybody struggling to get to sleep, stay asleep, get quality sleep? Stress? Anybody stressing? <laughs> cool. If anybody doesn't have their hand up, there's still time. You can run. Get another talk. You're good. And I want to talk to you afterwards. Need to, need to find out what you're doing. So I'm here to tell you to relax. Nothing is under control. We all are going through this. And this is why we need to be able to actually talk about it and have some sort of coping mechanisms. So what I'm going to do here is give you a bunch of life hacks. This is a very broad um, talk. There are a lot of topics that I cover, not necessarily in a lot of depth. But if you find the area you are specifically looking for, there are links in the slides. Or you can message me, and I can uh, give you uh, some sort of recommendation. There's also a bunch of book recommendations at the end. So I'd like to do a thought experiment. Just take a moment and think in terms of your life. What is the one thing that you could be doing that you're currently not doing that would improve your life vastly? Maybe it's that you should start walking every day. Maybe you should uh, cut out sugar in your diet. Maybe you should start learning something on Udemy or you know, whichever sort of uh, online course that you, are, you should be doing. So why aren't you doing it? You know, you've, you've just by definition said it's something that you should be doing. So, by show of hands, how many people say they don't have enough time? Everybody uses time as an excuse. Time is not your problem. You know, Doc Brown has a time machine. He's always in a hurry. There's, there's no way that you can ever have enough time. So you have to actually prioritize what's important to you. It's all about priorities. You make time for the things that matter. Now, let's say you decide you're only going to focus on one thing. And to be convoluted, I've chosen, let's watch all of the YouTube. There's, um, this is quite an old, old uh, stat, but there's about 300 hours of video released every minute on YouTube. Even if you wanted to, you would never be able to do it. You can't dedicate that much time, unless you've got the Hermione time turner. It just doesn't happen. So it's important that you actually pick realistic objectives, uh, and you pick parts of it that actually make sense. So I'm sure all of you have heard of the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle. If we take it back to our convoluted example, maybe you should only be watching the videos that actually interest you as opposed to all of the YouTube. So this is, uh, this is part of a, a concept called essentialism. Uh, there's a really great book on this. I've got a link in the end. Um, but basically, instead of saying, I'm going to do these 50 different things, you take that energy and your time and you invest it in one area, you focus on that. And you can see from the example, instead of focusing in a bunch of areas and getting almost no progress, you can just focus in one area and, and get some actual tangible results that will improve your life over there. So take that and apply that to this presentation. Don't try and do everything. You know, Focus on what your biggest uh, issue may be and see if you can't improve that. So 
in order to practice essentialism, what we have to do is we have to learn to say no to the things that are not essential, the things that detract from our lives, the things that don't add value. So how many of us uh, argue on the internet? Okay, okay, I'm a bit shy to put your hands up or, you know. Uh, <laughs> so stuff like that, yes, it might feel good in the short term, uh, in the moment, but what value is it actually adding to your life? And then a note on saying no, a lot of us want to say no, but in order to you know, preserve relationships or, in, or to preserve feelings, we say maybe. And this is not something that you should do uh, if you actually mean to say no. It's okay to say maybe if it's possibly a maybe, but doing that, just, it just detracts from your life. It kicks that can down the road and you cause yourself extra stress. So have the courage to start saying maybe. Sometimes we're not really sure if we actually want to do something. Now, Tim Ferriss, uh, in his uh, podcast and his book, Tribe of Mentors, talks about the rating system. Um, so if you were to think about a particular item that you are considering doing, uh, some sort of project or an activity, rate it on a scale of 1 to 10. If it's anything less than a six, uh, 7, it's basically a C mark. It's a 60%. You don't want to do that, so just don't do it. Know, unless there's some sort of obligation that's going to improve your life financially or something like that, then maybe you can bump it up. Anything that's 8 or higher, 80%, that's pretty good. Put it on the pile of, of possibly maybe stuff to do. You're not allowed to choose 7. That's the secret. 7 is where ambiguity lives. If you've got something and it's a 7, you're going to have to round it off. Move it somewhere else. Um, so that's pretty much essentialism in a, in a nutshell. Do less, but do it better. Focus on what actually matters. Uh, there's a great free talk uh, from Greg McCohen. Uh, the link's in the slides. And his book on essentialism is actually really, really good. A lot of examples that uh, will apply to your life. So now you've gone through your life and you've said, OK, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe I've eliminated some of it. But how do you then figure out what you should actually be doing? Uh, and what I've found helps a lot in this particular situation is using the Eisenhower decision matrix. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower was a five-star general in World War II and later went on to become a president. So, you know, if it worked well for his situation and all of his sort of uh, conundrums that he had to untangle, it'll probably work pretty well in your life. So I'm just going to go through each of the quadrants uh, pretty quickly. So we've got the urgent and important things. So this is when the baby's on fire, the kitchen is crying, that sort of thing. You know, you go and deal with that right now. Um, it, it's kind of the stuff that you've you got to get out of the way. Ideally, you don't want to be spending all of your time in this quadrant because you want to have taken the time to do, it, do a quality job on the things that are actually important. Then we've got the urgent and the not important things. These are normally uh, other people's meetings. Whatever's being discussed there is a priority to them. Is it actually a priority to you? Could you delegate some of this stuff? Could you outsource it? A lot of people don't consider that in their lives you can actually outsource a whole bunch of drama and admin. Your time is the most precious thing you have and what you actually spend it on is critical. Then we have the not urgent and the not important things. This is most of the TV you watch, uh, unless you're into cooking channel and you know you're gonna build up your skills in that. Uh, or if you find that TV is the one way you actually can uh, uh, switch off and uh, move on with your, your relaxation. Um, so, you don't want to spend uh, a lot of time in this quadrant. And then we come to uh, the not urgent and important stuff. This is where you want to spend the majority of your time. This is things like your personal development, your projects that you may have on, you know, your side projects, your pet projects that you've reserved the domain name for, but you haven't written a line of code. <laughs> That's where you want to be spending your, pro your time. So you've got to eliminate the other quadrant items so that you can actually do that. Now, a lot of us are very good at determining what things are urgent and what things are not. The things we generally struggle with is actually what is important, who is it important to, what parts of it are actually important. Do I have to do the whole thing? Is that 80-20 rule going to apply here? So in order to determine importance, one of the easiest ways to say, does this thing align with my purpose? Now, purpose is a very complicated thing, and it's, it's different for everybody. Uh, I recommend that if you haven't got a purpose, don't feel bad, 
99% of people don't. You know, we, we all sort of stumble through life saying, oh, okay, I feel like doing this, I feel like doing that. So it takes some time to actually uncover what your purpose may be. Um, and it's ideally the intersection of these four elements. If you can live your life in that center red block over there, you're doing better than most people. Uh, it's not necessarily easy, but uh, it is very rewarding and fulfilling. So a lot of people say, okay, so my purpose is to have as much pleasure as possible. Now on the surface, this seems like a really good idea. The problem is the more you do something for the purpose of uh, actually uh, enjoying it and having the pleasure, the more that pleasure goes down. This is something called hedonistic tolerance. And it happens pretty much with everything. You know, If you were to eat fillet steak every day, if that was your favorite meal, it doesn't become special, it's not special anymore, and you stop actually enjoying it. So, you know, that, that pleasure is actually a byproduct of a well-lived life. It's not the main aim itself. So, what is a well-lived life? And, you know, there's a lot of religion and a lot of philosophies that can help you with that. Um, I can't tell you what that is for you, and it's something you have to discover. Something that I found that works really well for me is stoicism. This is uh, from the ancient Greek word stoa, meaning step, where they would have uh, philosophical debates. Um, stoicism is a very complicated topic, and I'm not going to be able to do it justice in this talk. Uh, but it's, it's all about realizing what's in your control, what's outside of your control, and not spending all of your time and energy wonder, worrying about that stuff that you literally don't have any control about. You know, that's where the anxiety comes. And the Stoics say that living a good life is about living according to the four virtues. Uh, I've got the sort of traditional words and the, the more modern words over there. Uh, and you can dig down into that. Uh, there's a really great book uh, on Stoicism. Uh, uh, well, it's a collection of uh, meditations by Marco, Marcus Aurelius. Uh, and there's a great book, The Daily Stoic, which I recommend you get on Kindle every morning. Read the, the daily passage on Stoicism and reflect on it as, as much as you can throughout the day and see if you can apply the lessons that they talk about. In order to uncover your purpose, here are some really good resources. It will take time. It's not something you're going to discover in a weekend, but it's something worth doing that will contribute to your life. Cool. So once you've determined your purpose, there's some things that you can do to help you live, according, uh, live a better life. In the next few sections, I'm just going to go over them. I just want to be, put a bit of a disclaimer up front. Uh, I'm not uh, a medical doctor, so please, if you do have an existing condition or you're unsure of anything, please check with a physician beforehand. And, uh, you know, if you look at me, I'm not exactly in the best shape, but I'm getting there. You know, it's a process and it's a journey that you have to walk. Uh, and at least, you know, I'm on the road, so, you know, don't do an ad hominem uh, against me. Um, Again, not everything is applicable to everyone. Everybody's goals are different. Everybody's purposes are different. Everybody's bodies are different. So it's going to require some self-experimentation. But that's a really great habit to get into. Figure out what you, what you respond to, what habits work for you, uh, what, how different foods affect you. you know, we're all different. And it's important that we actually do that as opposed to taking the information at surface value. A great uh, habit to get into is the concept of Kaizen, continuous improvement. If you could improve, let's say, your diet or your exercise by 1% or even half a percent every day for the next 365 and a quarter days, imagine how that compounding interest starts to make massive improvements in your life. <laughs> and then a very important part of this is to surround yourself with people who are on a similar journey you know, you're the aggregate of the five people you spend the most time with. Odds are those are the people that you work with, and maybe your, your spouse, if you're lucky enough to spend enough time at home. You know? So those people, you want them to be a pushing you to do better. So find a mentor if, you're, if you're, uh, you don't have somebody on a similar journey. Somebody who's been there before and can help you when times get tough, because they will get tough. So it's important to do that. So how many of us... Uh, started off in January with uh, some New Year's resolutions. Just show of hands. Even one, if you had one New Year's resolution. Okay, so we've got a few people. So motivation was really high then, right? And then what happens? Yeah, the motivation kind of slides off the scale over there. So 
motivation is great to get you started. When you've got that motivation, you need to put things in place for when that motivation runs out, because I promise you it will run out. So hopefully, by the end of this talk, you're motivated to go out and try one thing from the talk, at least. You know, focus on something small. But remember that that motivation is going to fade. So you need to actually put those mechanisms in place. So there's two types of motivation. We've got the extrinsic motivation, which we're all probably pretty familiar with. This is the things like the carrot and the stick. If you do this, you will get a bonus at work. If you don't do this, I'll fire your sorry ass. So these are, these are, they work up until a point, but that motivation is not coming from within. Now, proper intrinsic motivation, that comes from three things, autonomy, purpose, and mastery. When you've got the mastery, the skills to do it, it's something that you actually want to do, and you've got the ability to do it in the way that makes sense to you. When those three things align, that's when motivation is going to be the highest. So use it while it's there. Another thing, willpower. How many of us have ever started a diet, but then you, know, you do the one cheat, or you break the diet once, and then it's pretty much finished, end of the road? Uh, seeing a few head nods, yeah. So you cannot rely on willpower. It's, it's not going to see you through. A better way to do it is to set up habits. How do habits work? We've got the different phases of a habit. We've got the cue, which is something triggers it. Ah, I'm feeling hungry. Then we've got the routine. I go eat a bunch of biscuits. Then we've got the reward. I feel satisfied. I've had food in my stomach. You can change your habits uh, very subtly by just changing one of the three parts. So it's very hard to change the cue, but the routine itself is a little bit easier. So if you spend your conscious effort, every time you feel hungry, instead of ignoring the hunger, you go and have a healthy option, a handful of, uh, of nuts. You, know, you can then get the same end result, which is that feeling of satisfaction, but with a different routine. The best way to actually change a habit, build a habit, or add a new habit is by changing your environment. There's a really great book by James Clear called Atomic Habits. speaks very in-depth about this and has a few examples of what you can do in your life. So I'm going to give you a practical example. If you want to start exercising, instead of uh, you know, just leaving your exercise clothes in the cupboard and hoping when you wake up in the morning you're going to go to gym, put your exercise clothes next to your bed. Take your work clothes, put them in a tog bag, put that by the front door. How many of you are going to go to the front door, get your work clothes, put your work clothes on? You feel guilty. You know, you've, you've changed your environment. Instead, you're going to get up, you're going to see your clothes. like, oh, yeah, I have to put my clothes on. Now you put your clothes on. You're going to go to gym because you're going to feel dumb just taking them off right away. You know, so do these little hacks in your environment that will allow you to succeed while your willpower and your motivation are there. So let's say you've got all of these things you could be doing. How do you actually decide and keep track of those things and make sure that you do do them? A great way is to put in place a productivity system. And one that I've found works really well is GTD, getting things done. I use a modified version, but I'll just go over the basic steps with you. The objective here is to get all of that noise out of your head so that you can actually get into flow and focus on what you're doing in the moment without having to worry that, oh yeah, after work today, I have to go pick up milk. Busy writing some code, must remember the milk, must remember the milk. You know, that, that's not going to be <laughs> conducive to getting you into a flow state. So the basic uh, five steps in GTD, step one, capture all of the stuff that's bouncing around in your head. You know, if you want to travel to the Maldives one day, put it down in your system. Now, this system is going to be your second brain. It's going to capture all of that stuff and worry about it so that you don't have to, and it'll prompt you at the right time. So you have to build your trust in this system. So capture every little thing. Uh, I've got an app on my phone that does text-to-speech with voice notes, so if I'm in the middle of a conversation, I can be like, oh yeah, remember to send the slides to Jake, that sort of thing. I can actually immediately capture that so that it's, I'm free, that emotional burden and that mental burden is gone. Now, once you've captured all of those things, you want to clarify. How many of you have ever put something on your to-do list, looked at it later, and had no idea what the hell it was talking about? It's like, you wrote that. I should totally remember what this means, but it doesn't make any sense. So clarify 
I tend to try and do this once every two days. You know, say, go through all the stuff in my inbox and say, what does this mean? What did I actually mean when I, meant, uh, when I wrote this down? Over time, you start getting better at writing down your to-do list when you initially capture them in a, in a format that actually makes sense, but it's not always possible. At this point, you can also say, oh yeah, the only way that I can actually do this is if I'm at the pharmacy or if I'm at the hardware store or at work. So you clarify the context that is required to actually do the work. Then we organize the things into various buckets. Um, so th this is kind of like the things that uh, you want to put together. This contributes towards this larger project that I'm doing. Uh, this can only be done at the hardware store, that sort of thing. Then you need to be able to, you need to reflect on your, your lists at least once a week. This is called the weekly review. Uh, this is when you go through and you say, oh yeah, what do I need to do within the next two weeks so that you're not caught unawares when that project is all of a sudden due. And this, build, this is the critical part. This builds the confidence in the system. So this allows you to actually do this. Now, um, David Allen, uh, who invented the GTD system, he does all of this with paper. Now, there's something magical that actually happens when you write stuff down and you do your planning on paper. I, I personally, I like a digital system, but when I'm planning my life, I do it on paper first. Because there's, there's no ads on paper, there's no... Uh, pop-ups and distractions and that sort of thing. So paper's a great medium to actually get this stuff down. And then lastly, you have to actually at some point go ahead and do some of the work. And that's where the engage part comes in. So uh, this is where you can get into your flow state, you know everything's organized, you're not going to have a pop-up and, uh, oh yeah, I forgot to do this meeting, because you've put all of this in your system. So yeah. One thing I will warn you about is the trap of productivity. Once you've got all of this stuff, it's very easy to do the little things and just knock out a whole bunch of them. That's okay if you're feeling low attention, low energy, but for the most part, what you want to do is put your big rocks in first. So I'm not sure if you know the story, just tell it quickly. University pro uh, professor takes a jar, puts it on the table in front of his students, fills it up with big rocks. He asks the class, is the jar full? I say, yeah, it's full takes out some sand, some gravel, pours it in, you know, doesn't take the rocks out, now it's like, okay, cool, now it's full, right, right? Ask the class. Yeah, of course it's full. Takes out a bottle of water, pours it in, and then it's full. If you put that water in first, your life, you'll never have space for the big rocks. The rocks is, is the things that are important to you, not the things that are gonna take the most time. Focus on the things that are important first, the things that align with your purpose. Another great productivity hack is eat a frog first thing in the morning. You know, we've, we, we often have this one task on our to-do list that causes us massive anxiety, like phone my stockbroker and, uh, you know, tell him to move my millions of rands across. Yeah, so it's like, okay, cool. Bit of a weird example, but okay. Um, do that one thing first. That way you don't have to feel the anxiety about it every time you glance at your to-do list. And if you get into that habit, you'll find that you spend a lot less time procrastinating. And if you've clarified the items on your to-do list, you'll spend a lot less time procrastinating. One of the biggest sources of procrastination is when you look at a to-do list item, you're like, what did I have to do for this thing again? So that comes back to your productivity uh, system. Clarify. Uh, Scott Hanselman has a really great talk on the Pomodoro technique. It's available for free, I think, on his blog and on YouTube. Just search for Scott Hanselman Productivity. The link is actually in the slides. Um, this is a great way, even if you're trying to get into flow, if you just have a quick checkpoint where you're like, okay, what am I trying to accomplish for the next 25 minutes? Okay, I have to get the database talking to this thing, or I'm doing some message queuing stuff. Just make sure that you don't go off on a weird tangent. Uh, and it's very effective for getting your productivity done. Cool. Then we come to exercise. So I'm not going to go over the benefits of exercising. I think they're pretty well known. All of us probably say, oh yeah, I should totally exercise more. I just don't have the time. So one of the, the important things is to have a bias towards action. I, I have a problem with this where I'm like, okay, cool, I'm going to start strength training at the gym. I better go research which strength training uh, program is the best so I can get the most results. And I'll do that for like a week. Now, imagine if I'd just gone to gym and picked up something slightly heavy. That would have far better results, return on investment. So you want to make sure that you have that bias towards action. Get something done. And then start small. Remember, 
we're not trying to kill our muscles while we've got all of this energy and motivation. It's like, quick, I better go lift 50 kgs and uh, see what I can do while this motivation's high because I'm not going to be able to go for like the next two months while the motivation's low. You're building a habit. So even if you go to the gym every day, because remember, everyday habits are a lot easier than sometimes habits. So just go to the gym every day and walk on the treadmill for two minutes. Anybody not able to do that? Two minutes on the treadmill at the slow speed. If you can just do that and build that habit for a month, and then the next, next month you increase that to five minutes, ten minutes. See what you feel comfortable with. Just being there and doing something and building that habit will pay dividends over the course of the next 20 years. So do that. Focus on building those habits. So what are some of the options so that you don't have to go research on exercises that you can do? Walking is a great one. Our bodies are designed to walk. It's a, it's a great activity that you can do with a spouse, with a partner, with a friend, at lunch, at work. Go walk around the block. You know, the, the, the science will tell you, you know, you should do 10,000 steps a day. If you're doing 100 steps a day right now, you know, from your car to the elevator, just walking 1,000 steps is much better. So go ahead and start small. Build that habit. Yoga is one that I really like. Uh, it's great because as people who work at a desk all day, I get a lot of neck, back, shoulder pain. So by doing the yoga, I actually get to stretch these muscles out. Um, there's a great app called Down Dog. Most of the stuff of, is available for there for free. You can do it at home so that you don't have to go to the gym and feel self-conscious about doing yoga in front of weird people. You know, you can do it pretty much wherever. If you're traveling, take a yoga mat with or do it on the carpet. It's good to go. Great option, join a gym. So very cost effective. There's a lot of things you can do at a gym. There's classes, you know, there's different machines, there's instructors. So if you're not confident, you can say, hey, Mr. Instructor or Mrs. Instructor, show me how to do the thing so I don't hurt myself. Because form is very important if you're going to be lifting stuff. If you do decide that weightlifting is for you, I highly rec recommend the Stronglift 5x5 program. It's got a lot of really good uh, starting strength. It's a way to build up that muscle very quickly. Now, on, on barbell and, and strength training in general, a lot of people say, no, women shouldn't lift heavy weights because they'll get too muscly. I don't think anybody in the history of time has ever accidentally put on too much muscle. <laughs> so saying that is very condescending to the people who have invested the time and the energy to actually go ahead and do that. So, if, you're if that's one of your concerns, don't be concerned about it. You can always just stop lifting heavy things if you're worried, you know, if, if it gets to that point. Increase the amount of reps that you do, that sort of thing. If you do travel a lot or you don't feel like joining the gym, one thing you can do is one or two rounds of the seven-minute workout. So it's each of these exercises, uh, I think with a 30-second in between, uh, break and you do them for 30 seconds. It takes seven minutes. You know, if you can't find seven minutes in your day to exercise, you probably need to find something else, a uh, new job maybe. You know, there's, uh, and this is an example of high intensity interval training. So for those of you who are not familiar, this is what it looks like on a heart rate chart. You know, you've got these massive peaks and massive troughs. Uh, well, if you're doing it right, you, you get those. Uh, it's very effective, very great for your cardiovascular health. And this is what it looks like. <laughs> no matter what exercise program you try and uh, you decide you want to try, the way that you're going to improve over time is through some sort of progressive overload. Either you're going to start walking longer, further, faster, you're going to lift heavier, more reps, um, or different form. Progressive overload is how you get better at that. That thing that you're struggling with right now that feels painful, in a month's time of progressive overload, that thing's trivial. So, you know, you, you might be struggling to do 10 uh, bi bi bicep curls uh, with 10 kgs now. In a month, in two months, when you look back and you're doing 20, it's a lot easier. And this is what gets you stronger. Then we come to nutrition. So nutrition is very important. You know, it's, it's, if you look at any, if you happen to have a, a desire to lose weight, nutrition is normally about 80% of the battle. Exercise, exercise has a lot of benefits, but Diet is where you actually want to focus a lot of your energy. So just a quick note on eating disorders. They are a real thing. 
Um, you know, myself, I'm an emotional eater. When I'm stressed, I want a pizza. I want two pizzas. I put the pizza on top and I put KFC in the middle. <laughs> you know. So if you, if you do have a, um, a problem with your relationship with food, there are ways to help and you should just speak to, speak to somebody who you trust before embarking on any of these nutritional um, uh, guidelines, please. Um, one of the big things that you can do is drink more water. Water is, uh, is, is critical for pretty much every biological process that happens in the body. So you want to make sure you stay hydrated. Now, a lot of people will tell you, you know, you must drink eight glasses of water. Wait, what is it European glass, imperial metric? What are we doing? You know, what are we talking about here? The important thing is, is not necessarily exactly how much water you're drinking. If you feel thirsty, drink. You don't have to overhydrate. You don't have to meet some sort of mythical target. Your body actually gets a lot of the fluid that it needs from the food that you eat. But staying hydrated is important, and it will actually help with your weight loss. How many of you were taught a food pyramid similar to this in school? Okay, so uh, a note on this food pyramid. Uh, it, was, uh, it was funded by some of the agricultural societies who grew a lot of maize and corn. Mm -hmm. So there might be a bit of a conflict of interest in how this thing is actually structured. The other problem with the traditional food pyramid is it assumes everything at every level is, exa is exactly the same. And so are all grains and carbohydrates the same? You know, we have whole wheat, we have uh, white, we've got rye. This is a weird assumption to make, and it doesn't hold true. So take what you know about this food pyramid and throw it away. Then a lot of us uh, have heard about calories, right? and uh, you, know, you should count calories, or you must get this many calories. Uh, just a note on calories, not every calorie is the same. You'll notice from this graph, if I eat one calorie of protein, about 30% of that uh, energy that's contained in that protein is used to digest that protein. So if you're eating 1,000 calories of protein every day, you're actually only getting 700. Uh, carbohydrates, you can see a little bit better, uh, uh, sorry, a little bit worse, and fats, you know, uh, it's very efficient to convert fats into energy. But fats have a lot of other advantages. Where does that energy actually go in our body? You know, we've got the thermic effect of food, which is what we've just looked at. So some of that energy is used to break down the food. We've got our physical activity that's going to the kitchen to get more food um, and walking, ho and hopefully your new exercise regime. And then we've got our basal metabolic rate. So that's what our body uses to keep us alive. That's you know, doing all of our mental processes, that's keeping your heart and lungs working, uh, all of the uh, chemical reactions that happen in your body, maintaining your body temperature, that sort of thing. So if we go back to our 80-20 rule, can we focus on getting this blue circle as big as possible? There's a few ways we can actually do this, so that while we're doing as little as possible, while we're not at gym, we can burn as many calories. Now, one of the best ways is with muscle. The more muscle you have, the higher your basal metabolic rate, and that's because muscle takes more energy to upkeep than fat cells do. Uh, another thing, believe it or not, spicy food. Spicy food raises your basal metabolic rate. Uh, drinking cold water or taking off a jacket in winter that also, you, you know, your body has to heat that water up before it can actually make use of that. Now, these things all have small effects, but if you do a bunch of them together, you get those extra gains. And also getting enough sleep. If you get enough sleep, your basal metab metabolic rate is actually also higher. And uh, for us as developers, coffee, and if you're a tea person, oolong tea, increases your basal metabolic rate. So that's why you'll talk all about the, you'll see all the green teas and that sort of thing, help with weight loss. It's, uh, it's actually true, they help increase that. Uh, so I've got on the next few slides, just some examples of healthy foods that you can eat. So don't worry too much about them. This is not an exhaustive list. Don't restrict your diet to only this stuff, um, but it does show you what, what some of the options that are available to you and uh, actually are. And a lot of them are really tasty. So we've got the healthy fats, uh, I love avocado personally. I, I do prefer it with a piece of toast if I can get it, but uh, I try to stay away from the toast. Uh, then we get carbs. Carbs get a bit of a bad rap, you know, especially lately, but not all carbs are bad. If you do not have a weight problem, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't eat, eat uh, the carbs that you enjoy. And even if you do have a weight problem, you can responsibly add carbs into your diet uh, as, as you need. It's, it's all in how you actually do it. 
sugar. Um, I don't think there's anything uh, good to say about sugar, so that should pretty much be eliminated from your diet, which is actually harder than you would think. If you start reading the ingredients labels on food, you'll see sugar is pretty much in everything, in its myriad forms. They sometimes try and discover, disguise it. High fructose, corn syrup, multidextrose, that sort of thing. Uh, all of that is sugar. Then protein, uh, there's a big overlap with protein and the high fat, um, which is really great. Salmon, uh, it is a bit more difficult uh, if uh, you are vegan, but it is not impossible. There are a lot of really high uh, protein foods that you can get there. Um, of all of the food groups, the one your body can actually do without is carbs. You need fats, your organs need fats. You need proteins in order to keep your muscles going. Carbs. They're, they are a great source of energy, but they're not uh, essential. That's why there's essential fatty acids, uh, but no essential carbohydrates other than pizza. <laughs> then we come to micronutrients. There are a variety of vitamins, minerals, and other micronutrients that your body actually needs to perform the functions that it does. So if you eat a varied diet, if you eat a lot of different things, you can actually gain a lot of these micronutrients. If you're the type of person that likes to eat the same thing every day, probably time to invest in a, a multivitamin. Um, and multivitamins can work, uh, but you should just have yourself tested to see what actually works. So personally, I've struggled pretty much for all my life with weight loss, uh, or, or trying to maintain weight loss. So I did a bit of research into how the body actually stores fat. And this is actually very interesting, and it shows why the, the ketogenic diets actually work. When you eat carbs, they get converted into glucose in your bloodstream. Now, glucose, if it gets too high, is actually a poison. So what your pancreas does is it secretes insulin. That insulin stimulates your muscles uh, and certain other cells to take in that glucose and store it as fat. So insulin plays a very important role in the fat storage mechanism. So you actually want to, uh, over time, decrease your insulin resistance. Because what happens normally, you know, we eat three times a day and then we have three snacks a day. So your insulin level is pretty high over time, which means your body has to release more and more insulin to prevent you from poisoning yourself. Now, one of the easiest ways to reduce insulin resistance is through ketosis. This is what happens when you eat a high-fat or high-protein diet and you eliminate carbs. Uh, what happens is your body switches from using glucose as its primary fuel source to using ketones. An easy way to get into ketosis is by fasting, skipping meals. Growing up, you were told skipping meals is bad. No, you can't not eat, right? This is bad conventional wisdom. Fasting has been done for hundreds of thousands of years. It's a religious practice, it's been a health practice, and the science is showing that it's actually incredibly beneficial for cleaning out the cells, replacing dead tissues, and that sort of thing. There are a number of ways that you can fast. The easiest way, skip breakfast. There are more complicated regimes you can follow. There's one meal a day, which is what I've been practicing, or often called the warrior diet. You eat one meal a day, and I choose dinner because that's when I'm at home with my fiance. A great way to improve your relationship with food is to practice mindful eating. So what happens here is that you take a bite of food, and instead of immediately swallowing it so you can shovel the next bite in, you put your fork down and you focus on the textures and the flavors that are in the food. And you enjoy the food and, and figure out when you're actually full. Reflect. There's a whole bunch of techniques that you can use over there. Cool. So speaking about mindfulness, one of the great ways you can improve your life is by meditating. I personally practice mindful meditation, which allows me to then make decisions in my life that will improve my life for the better in the long term as opposed to the short term. Now, it's not magic. It's not hocus pocus or some sort of uh, you know, weird uh, uh, invocations. It's scientifically proven that people who practice mindful meditation's brains look differently on a CAT scan. Now, if you're the type of person who gets angry quickly, what meditation will actually do is it gives you around about a half second before you explode to decide, am I going to explode? And I'll tell you now, that, that half second doesn't seem like a lot, but it, is dramatically, it can have a dramatic effect on your life. And it can also make uh, that half second, but when you're ordering from the restaurant menu, like what should I have, uh, you, know, you can say, okay, well, 
I know I want the burger and the chips, but maybe I'll have the burger with the side salad and no bun, or you know, whatever. Make healthier choices for your life as a whole. Uh, meditation actually helps you stay exercising, hel helps you make uh, healthier eating choices, and uh, go to sleep better. And that brings us to sleep. Sleep is, is important for a whole host of reasons. Uh, it's important for our cognitive ability. Uh, you know, you'll hear people say that um, muscles aren't made in the gym, they're made at home. What they mean by that is if you're getting enough of the right nutritional um, requirements, when you're sleeping is actually when your body is rebuilding your muscle. You tear down your muscle in the gym or exercising, you build it back up while you're asleep. So it's important to get that sleep. So how do you sleep better? Well, one of the, the easiest ways, make sure your bedroom is your sanctuary. There should be no work that is brought into your bedroom. Leave that for outside. Do that in the lounge if you have to. Um, it, the bedroom is pretty much for sleeping and for having sex only. So keep it to those two people. How do you sleep better? Well, it's, you know, the way we evolved is we fall asleep when it's dark. You know, we, we, we sort of evolved in caves and seeping under the stars when there's no lights and artificial blue lights everywhere. So uh, you want to keep it as dark as possible. If you do absolutely have to use your phone in bed, make sure you've got some sort of filter on there. Uh, and um, if you can, get blackout uh, backing for your curtains. It is incredibly uh, awesome for helping you to sleep better. Now, in terms of noise, it needs to be as quiet as possible. Uh, if you live next to a busy road, you might want to invest in a white noise generator or some comfortable earplugs. Personally, I, I've tried it. I, I can't really sleep with earplugs in. Um, but if, you ca if you're one of those lucky people who can, that, you know, more power to you. If you're going to be sleeping with blackout curtains, then you're not going to wake up the way that you are, have evolved to you know, with the sunrise. So what I did is I got a very dodgy Chinese imported light from Amazon. Um, and I put it next to my bed, and 30 minutes before I've set the alarm, the light comes on, and it slowly gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And I tell you, nine times out of 10, I wake up before my alarm, I don't feel groggy, and I feel refreshed and ready to hit the day. The traditional alarm clock of juddering you out of sleep is absolutely horrible, and it doesn't care which sleep cycle you wait, wake up in. There are a bunch of really cool apps that you can use that will, uh, you put your phone on the bed and it'll actually track uh, or try and estimate which part of your sleep cycle you're in and try and wake you up within the best part of your sleep cycle so you're not groggy. So that's also a great thing. Temperature is very important when you're sleeping. You want to keep it as cool as possible. The ideal temperature is between 15 and 20 degrees Celsius. Now, there's a, bunch, there's a chili pad that you can get uh, if you've got lots and lots of money that you can import. It's a mat that goes on your bed and it regulates the temperature. So, you know, even if you've got an air con, the temperature might be cold outside, but under the covers, it's really, really warm. So the chili pad prevents that problem by running cold water through a bunch of uh, um, t uh, tubes while you're sleeping. If you are like me and you can't really afford that, Open the window. Uh, if, if you can, you can always get a portable air con or at least some sort of fan uh, and keep, try and keep that temperature as cool as possible. Air quality actually plays a very important role in your sleep. Now, if you are going to invest in an air, uh, air conditioner, try and get one that has an air purifier as well. You can buy standalone air purifiers or you can open the window to get some airflow in there so that the carbon dioxide doesn't build up. Build up. Uh, humidity is quite important. So if you can find something like a humidifier, dehumidifier, find what works for your body. And uh, if you are a smoker, don't smoke in your bedroom because that, that will destroy your quality of sleep. The food and drink that you have before sleep has a massive uh, impact. If you're drinking water right up until you go to sleep, uh, you know, you're going to be getting up quite a lot in the night and interrupting your own sleep cycle to go to the bathroom. Excessive banqueting will cause indigestion and, uh, you know, alcohol before bed, might, you might think it helps you sleep. It helps you get to sleep, but it actually destroys the quality of sleep because your body, your liver is processing this toxin while you're sleeping and actually uh, getting you, uh, preventing you from reaching deep sleep. A great way to uh, get to sleep better, to improve your quality of sleep, is get into a proper routine. Try and go to bed at the same time every day, even on weekends, and try and wake up at the same time every day, even on weekends. Build a routine that teaches your body it's about to be time to go to sleep. So I put meditation, 
I, um, you know, I'll have a glass of ca uh, mug of chamomile tea, that sort of thing. Just get into, build a routine that teaches your body, hey, it's time to switch off now and go to sleep. And a note on naps. Winston Churchill napped pretty much every day, and he helped win World War II, so it's a pretty good, uh, uh, th therefore it is a pretty good hobby to get into. I say hobby because it's quite enjoyable. So um, a nice life hack you can do is, uh, if you're doing, going to do intermittent fasting, you're not going to eat lunch maybe, so maybe go to your car and spend that 30 minutes having a nap in your passenger seat. Take a cushion with put some headphones in and do some uh, meditation or you know, just put some uh, binaural beats and uh, get that going. So we've all heard that sitting is the new smoking. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's bad. Uh, and as developers and uh, UX people and, and that sort of thing, we tend to have a desk job where we sit a lot. There's a few things you can do to combat this. The yoga is really great, like I mentioned before. You can get an adjustable standing seating desk. Very good. You can get a treadmill desk. Treadmill desk uh, is very cool, uh, very expensive though. Uh, so probably a little bit more practical is to just get up from your desk when you do those 25 minute pom Pomodoros and walk around a little bit. And if you're gonna be drinking water every time uh, you finish a Pomodoro, you're gonna have to go to the bathroom pretty often so it self reinforces. Cool, so I've got some book recommendations over there that I'll get sent out and some recommended blogs and podcasts. And of course, if you would like to, feel free to follow me uh, on Twitter, and I'll be sending out some information over there. Uh, yeah, and thank you so much for coming to the talk, everybody.